This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Jane Sugimura, and this is Condo Insider. Uh, this is the show about condominium living and for people who live and work in condos. And today uh, on my show, I've got a very good old friend, Richard Port, uh, who's a longtime uh, condo owner advocate. Uh, we've worked, uh, for, I've known Richard for many years, and we've worked hand-in-hand hand on condominium issues. Thank, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm glad to be here, and uh, we have been longtime friends. And, and, and Richard, tell me, I mean, you, you used to be a condominium owner, and you served on boards for many, many years. Yes. Tell me how you got involved with condos. Well, I moved into a, a condo in December 1974, but like many condo owners, I didn't get involved immediately. In fact, I was happy, you know, working hard at my work and uh, wanted other people to run the business of the condo. But around 1980 or 81, I think 80, uh, I, w I began to hear some things that were happening in the condo from other owners, and so I decided to get involved. Initially, I was on a building and grounds committee for my condo, and uh, uh, the president uh, asked us to look into storage lockers for owners. And we came up with a plan, uh, and uh, I wanted to attend the board meeting at which this was going to be discussed. But uh, I was told, no, only board members can attend board meetings. So the chair of our committee was a board member, but I wasn't allowed to attend. And I said, that doesn't seem right. So I went up to the legislature, and I mentioned this to them. I said, your meetings are open. Shouldn't, shouldn't the condo meetings be open? And they said, well, that sounds reasonable. So they passed a law allowing any owner to attend board meetings. Until that time, up until that time, you could only attend the annual meetings or mm -hmm. special association meetings. The following year, I went up and I said to the legislature, well, what about absentee owners? Shouldn't they be able to get the minutes of the meetings? And the legislators said, well, that sounds reasonable. So they passed another law that uh, owners could, uh, who couldn't attend, maybe mainland or wherever, uh, they would be able to get uh, the minutes. So each year I kept looking at what were the issues in condos that needed to be dealt with. Uh, one of the more important, well two of the more important issues over time were the uh, ability to get the financial documents, the monthly uh, financial statements, and also uh, to be able to get uh, contracts that had already been signed. I realized, and I still realize, that uh, when they're in negotiation, the owners uh, have to wait and let the board members do their work. But once the, uh, the contracts are signed, they should be able to have access to the contracts. So over those years, a number of those kind of issues, uh, and then I got into different type of issues. That is, Generally speaking, you could only be elected by the board if you had sufficient proxies. Well, most of the proxies went out from the board, and the board members would get the proxy, usually to the board as a whole or maybe to the president of the board. And it, it meant that only the friends of the board members or the friends of the president would be able to be elected to the board, generally speaking. So uh, I was able to work uh, by that time, I think I was beginning to work with you and the legislature, and we were able to change the law that owners were able to get owners' lists, which they had not had never before been able to get, get owners' lists and go out with their own attempt to gain proxies to get on the board. So that was kind of the second level of work that I was involved in. And um, so to the point now where an owner who feels that they can contribute to the board can actually uh, get sufficient proxies to be elected to the board. Not easy, but it's done. And and you know how do, how do, how do you learn about these issues? I mean, I mean, were you actually impacted, or did people come and tell you? And how did they know to get in touch with you? Well, there were two ways that this happened. Some, the early ones that I already mentioned, uh, it was uh, my, through my own experience, but. 
gradually I get I was beginning to get questions from people who lived in other condominiums mm -hmm. and they uh, started saying well can we do this can we do that and if it sounded reasonable uh, I uh, actually would I, I actually started a small organization that uh, worked on helping other condominiums owners who were having problems and so I did hear these issues secondhand mm -hmm. it wasn't only in my building but I would hear them in in other buildings and um, uh, then, of course, I got involved in the Hawaii Council of Association of Property Own Owners, or called HCCA now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with your help, we were able to get into uh, other issues. I think the ones that I've already mentioned were very basic kinds of issues that and really... The, and, and this is the one about getting documents. Yes. So that the owners, one, one of the uh, basic rights that owners have is if, you know, they are members of an association, so there are certain documents relating to the management and administration of the uh, building. A good that point because, uh, for example, the, con the management contract, uh, pr previously you could only if you were a board member could you get that contract and we were able to get uh, access to those kind of documents. Okay, and, and, and so uh, there were uh, some, you went to the legislature and you got the bills passed and so now the homeowners um, were, at least on paper, under the Hawaii law, were entitled to get certain of these documents. Right. Did that cure the problem? Not totally, <laughs> because sometimes uh, there would be a denial. Uh, even though that was what the law said, there would be a denial. And so it was, the, the immediate problem was the only way you could get access to the documents if the other side refused was to go to court mm -hmm. and that's a very expensive process that many uh, owners would not be able to afford right and uh, so we were stymied for a while on that issue and then I think uh, you began to, to work on this question of mediation and uh, uh, the other related issues uh, to, to get and, and, and the DCC uh, set up uh, RICO that's the correct yeah. The, and RICO is the Regulated Industries Complaint Office. And so basically what that organization does is uh, any um, agency or group that is regulated by the state of Hawaii, DCCA, and that would be contractors and realtors and licensed professionals and condominiums right. are all kind of regulated by the DCCA. So if you fall into that category and you have a con concern, then uh, you can make a complaint uh, to uh, the RICO office, yeah. who will then uh, basically investigate. And not only, not only that, but even as a little bit of a basic uh, effort within the, the RICO was the ability, for example, well, within, within DCCA was to be able to find out who was whether the contractors that were being used were licensed mm -hmm. and whether there had been any complaints mm -hmm. against those particular contractors. And occasionally, uh, at one point I became president of my condo and when I became president, I would always contact the DCCA and make sure that we were using licensed contractors and we would also look at the complaints against them. Mm -hmm. So that even for some of the other issues like mediation and arbitration, they, the RICO was very helpful uh, and the DCCA was very helpful in terms of those kind of issues. And that's important because you don't want to hire a contractor who's not uh, stable and is not, uh, for example, not able to be bonded and so forth. Right. And, right, and who doesn't have the insurance in case he gets hurt. Right. Because if he got hurt on your property, your, the association would end up paying it Correct. for his workers' comp. Correct. Right? So, I mean, all these things are, are really, really important. And, and, and the people who, who sit on boards really, you know, um, uh, unless they, uh, you know, make sure that they use licensed contractors, they don't know until there's a, a problem. That's right. And I think there have been a few condominiums that have run into that kind of problem. And uh, it's also incumbent, now that we have those protections, mm -hmm. it's incumbent on boards to make sure that they they find out whether the contractors they're using are licensed. And in fact, uh, in I think many condos, the 
condo board requires that individual owners use licensed contractors as when well. When they do work inside their units. Right. Right? Yeah, okay. And um, uh, so you were talking about you know, uh, uh, several issues, and uh, one of them was dispute resolution. And under the condominium statute, there, there, there are two, two things you can do. You can either mediate or arbitrate. Right. And um, early on, by the way, although we had that right, it was very difficult to get uh, a board, a condo board, to agree to mediate or arbitrate. And it was only after some work that, uh, for example, uh, your organization did that was able to get uh, uh, a better uh, response to requests for mediation and arbitration. And right, and, and a couple of years ago, one of the things, one of the new changes that happened was evaluative mediation. And you and I went down to the Real That's Estate true. Commission and we, we testified in support of evaluative mediation. That's right. And, it, and evaluative mediation is basically uh, a mediation where you have a neutral and the parties in the dispute go and tell the neutral their you know, the neutral listens to both sides. And then, and what happens in a, 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 a typical mediation is that neutral tries to bring the two parties together. Mm -hmm. In evaluative mediation, the neutral makes, gives you an opinion. And at the, at one of the uh, organizations that are, you know, contracted by the state of Hawaii to do evaluative mediation, dispute prevention resolution, their neutrals are retired judges. That's right. Right? And you know, so you know, most people, you know, will give a lot of credence to some you know, judges as well. You know, you got a crappy case, or hey, you know, you've got a really good case. Right. And you know, so I mean, I think we both agreed that that's probably a step better than just Much regu better. regular regular mediation because the person who gets the opinion from a retired judge that they got a crappy case, I mean, kind of knows that they can't go any further, and if they, and if they can't resolve it in that uh, that medium. That they, you know, they, they just have to, you know, give it up. But anyway, um, and evaluative mediation is paid for by the state of Hawaii. That's right. By the Condo Ed Fund. And you know what the Condo Ed Fund. Tell, tell us about the Condo Ed Fund. Well, basically, uh, every, every uh, owner, every condo, and every owner in a condo has to pay into a fund that goes to uh, support the effort of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, and especially condo uh, condo on condo issues. Right. And so that, that, that's used to subsidize education of board members and owners. And um, it's also, uh, be, because of legislation, it's being used for mediation. Yeah. Right? And so that means that if a condo owner has a dispute, that really they should elect uh, evaluative mediation, go into mediation because it's subsidized by their own maintenance fees that they're, they pay. That's it's right. not like they write a check. They have to pay their maintenance fees and the association they belong to gets billed by the state of Hawaii right. and the association writes the check. So the condo owner never knows, uh, I mean, ne is not aware of the fact that they're paying into this right. fund. That's right. But, but yet, you know, if they have a dispute, that's the one place they should go to because the fund will subsidize their, their dispute resolution. Right. Right? And that's better than a lawsuit. Oh, absolutely. Lawsuits are very expensive. Right. And, and, a, and a lot of unit owners, a lot of homeowners, you know, really can't afford filing a lawsuit. Against uh, their whatever. association. Yeah, right. And, you know, even when, the so even when they go up against their association, it's almost like, you know, a double whammy because they have to pay their own attorney's fees and their, con their maintenance fees are paying for the condominium. That's right. To sue you. You're paying both ways. Right. So you're paying both ways. And so, you In know. In fact, it could get worse. You can end up having to pay the legal fees of the association. Right. Well, you know, we're, we're uh, right about our midpoint. So let's take a, a one minute break. Okay. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about some new legislation, some current legislation uh, that has updated some of these areas. And perhaps so, we can touch on uh, owners responsibilities yes and board responsibilities okay we can do that when we get back this is think tech hawaii raising public awareness
thank you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, welcome back uh, to Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and we have uh, as my uh, uh, guest a very good old friend, uh, R Richard Port, and uh, we're talking about owner's rights, or the evolution of owner's rights, because Richard's been involved in this since the 70s, right? That's true. And so, you know, we've been talking about the different issues that you've been involved with and, and the changes, uh, uh, that have happened, but you know, uh, you know, condo owners have rights. They also have obligations, don't they? That's right. Why don't we talk about the obligations? Sure. That well, they some of the simpler ones that everybody understands. First of all, they have they have an obligation to pay their maintenance fees mm -hmm. and in a timely manner. Uh, otherwise, they end up with delinquencies and foreclosures, and nobody wants that. So that's the basic right, a basic responsibility that they have. But also, they have a responsibility. To, uh, to themselves and to other owners to pay attention to what's going on in the building. Uh, and that means the good things and the bad things. They, for example, if they see that the, uh, the office, uh, the maintenance, the, the management office is not uh, well staffed or that some things are, some people are being put down uh, by the staff, uh, those kind of things uh, should be reported to the uh, board members so that they know what they're finding or if there's litter around in the building so that that's one side of what need they need to do also they really should try especially if they live in the building or live in the community they should try to attend if not every board meeting at least occasionally attend board meetings so that they know the kind of decisions that the board is having to make uh, not all the decisions are easy for example one of the things that we find now in all the buildings in Hawaii, they're getting older. Uh, the buildings that are now 30, 40, close to 50 years old, uh, they have major maintenance uh, problems. And so the, the residents have to be prepared, uh, the, I'm sorry, the owners have to be prepared to help the board in paying for those and not just complain about the maintenance fees going up. But I think uh, a, a true uh, uh, way of looking at it is owners should pay attention. If there are newsletters, they should pay attention. If, uh, certainly, if now that they have access to minutes, they should pay attention to the minutes. Boards are beginning to send those out by email, uh, and uh, access is much better than it was back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. But, you know, I think, you know, as a uh, together with you know owners' rights, and you're talking about owners. Well, now we're talking about owners' responsibilities. One of the things I think that I he I've I've been hearing is that you know owners, uh, when you're talking about association staff, they kind of feel that these people are their employees, yeah. right? Yeah. And 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 you always hear this situation about some unit owner telling an association staff member, maybe housekeeping or maintenance, yeah. you know, to run an errand for them or oh, to no. help them. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and even though they see them every day and, you know, and you know the staff, I mean, they, they don't want to say no, they don't want to offend a unit owner. But, you know, and, and, and as a board president, I mean, I've had to step in and basically tell the unit owner, you know, these people work for the association. They do not work for you. Right. You are a member of the association, right. but you cannot ask them to do work for you because there's a liability issue and you know and we just can't if you have 300 units you can't have a staff running errands for the people who live in the building related to that is the issue of uh, there should be no favoritism by the board of certain owners being able to get certain services that other owners are not able to right. get uh, one of the examples is uh, you know most most uh, buildings have uh, 
at times where you can, like 10 minutes in a, in a 10 minute zone for parking. You can't have the friends of the board uh, able to park there 30 minutes while other owners are, are uh, uh, given, uh, uh, you know, noted after 10 minutes uh, that they are in violation. Right, I mean, I mean, I think that's one of the f common complaints that, that we hear is preferential treatment. Right. Right. Everybody, Absolutely. including the people who sit on the board, have to be treated the same. Right. And, and if there are rules, they apply to everybody from the board president down to the person who owns a, you know, a studio apartment. A true story. One time uh, I forgot where I had parked my car and I was there for probably 30 minutes in a 10 minute zone. I had, when I came down to my car, I had a violation notice on my car, and that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And I was president at the time, but that, mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. Yeah, and then, you know, so, so with, with unit owners, I mean, they, they do have rights, but one of their rights is when it comes to the staff, the, the employees, they are not their bosses. Yeah, that's right. right. And, 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 I, and it's really hard when you live in a, in a building with, you know, three, four, five hundred unit owners and they've been there for 20, 30 years and, right. and the staff has been there maybe just as long and after a while they figure, hey man, you know, I live here, you're, you're an employee, I can tell you what to do and you know, that's totally wrong. We should touch on uh, board obligations too. Okay. Uh, not only uh, to treat everybody fairly but also to make sure that owners have information that is accurate and timely. If there are going to be major expenses they, they need to keep the owners notified of those kinds of expenses. And uh, it also means that uh, they can't just say, oh, well, we won't raise maintenance fees this year, and then suddenly they don't have enough money to take care of the things that need to be done. So there are some obligations that the uh, board members uh, have as well. Right. And, 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 you know, th but that's a whole separate episode that, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, done before. But, you know, there was some recent legislation, in fact, this past year, where, and in fact, you were almost central to one of the issues, and that was Act 196, which the governor signed this year in, in July, and it becomes effective on January 1, 2019. And that's where, this is about mediation, right? And one of the changes in that bill was the people who can benefit from uh, uh, mediation. And what we did is we went in and we changed it. And we said, if you are a board member and you're fighting with your board, you now can do mediation because yes. you were never in That's that right. group as well as managing agents. Right. Why, how did that, why, why did we go to, through that process? Well, in the simple, in the simplest way, we would think, oh, it's usually uh, board versus owners, but uh, occasionally there can be a split, a minority group and a majority group on a board. That happens too. And, and in fact, it happened to you. That's correct. And so uh, that's why we needed to change that law. And fortunately, uh, I must say, uh, I must, uh, we must give credit to the legislature in listening to some of these peculiarities, especially now, it was easy in the 80s when they could see, hey, it makes perfect sense to be able to make some of the changes that I spoke about earlier. But uh, now we've made so many improvements to the law. Uh, some of the things that we get into now don't happen very often, but when they happen, they, they do need to be dealt with. And in your case, you did get into a dispute with your board, That's and you true. did request mediation. That's and how long did it take? Two years. Two years, and and it it, it took and it a court. Be, it should be two months. Right, and it took a court proceeding to do that. That's right. And 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 if I recall, the judge chewed us out like, what were we doing in this courtroom, wasting his time? That's right. And he and he banned us to the media <laughs> mediators, and and it, and it did get resolved rather quickly it after did. two after two years. But then this was before this change happened. Right. But we went to the legislature and said, you know, if you don't, this is why you have to make this change because we can't have people like you, and you weren't the only one where you were having a trouble problem. And even in my case, I knew most of the laws. So, I, you know, some owners don't know some of the protections we've already talked about today. Mm -hmm. They don't know their, all of their rights. 
So in my case, I knew my rights, and yet I still had to wait two years. Right. And, and another thing we did, because of the process we were going through, this bill also has a provision in there that says, if you demand mediation and you don't get it, and you have to go to court to order, get a court order to, uh, you know, force the other side into uh, mediation, that you're entitled to get your attorney's fees up to fifteen hundred dollars. Right. right. That right. was also part of uh, this. And and, and, a, and I and I remember when we went into the legislature, they said, "Well, why do you need that?" It's like, because otherwise, you know, nobody listens. Yeah. I mean, the statute right. says "shall." Yeah. But you know, they just stonewall you and they just don't want right. to comply right. and so we basically say you know if you guys really mean shall and you really mean that this is a mandatory law then you got to give us some some tools so that we can implement it while we're, while we're mentioning this for those who are watching this presentation if they have questions about issues that need to be addressed at the legislature the best way is to contact you to let you to let you know what kind of issues and complaints that they have. Right, and that's uh, that's been how we've gotten some changes. To, but be, you know, before we run out of time, too, that very same statute allowed for voluntary arbitration. That's right. Binding arbitration, and that's different from what's on the books because uh, right now we have a arbitration statute with a de novo provision. That's right. And with the de novo provision, that means you go all the Step way through arbitration. Way and then do it all over again. Right. And if, the, and if one party who loses is unhappy, they can ask for a de novo review. And so you start from square one. But this one, in, un, under Act 196, allows you, the parties, to voluntary, voluntarily enter into binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then the condo ed will sub condo ed fund will subsidize that arbitration. Yeah, that's right? great. Yes. That's so a real improvement. So that's a big improvement. A big improvement. And so so you know these things have come about because people like you and other condo owners said, you know, we need to have a, a mechanism so that our disputes, our gripes can be heard and resolved quickly, cheaply without going to court. And I'm hoping some younger people who are watching this will, you know, take over for people like me and, and, and me and, and uh, work on some of these issues. Right. And so, so that, you know, and, and those are, you know, great, um, you know, advances that we've made uh, because it expands, it expands the, uh, the, 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 the scope of the remedies that are available. And what it does is it allows people to resolve their problems quickly without spending a whole lot of money. Right. It kind of puts people on an even playing field. Yeah. Well, I, I want first of all to uh, tell everybody who's watching this that the person who has done the most is Jane Sugimura, <laughs> uh, the, the person who's uh, taking charge here today and on Think Tech Hawaii. And I hope that you'll be able to continue to do it, but also this people will step forward and uh, show interest in making fairness in condo living uh, a reality. Well, thank you for, for the endorsement. And, you know, we've run out of time, and uh, we thank people for uh, joining us. And next week, I'm going to have somebody, I have a representative from the uh, Mediation Center of the Pacific, and they do that of mediation Terrific. of condominium disputes. And so uh, I hope you tune in next week. And her name is Katie Rainey. And she will be my guest next week on Condo Insider, the show for condo living. Thank you very much for joining us, and good afternoon.